Okay, good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. My name is Michael Manzioni and I'm the CEO at Rakuten Super Logistics, or better known as RSL. Just a little background on the company. Since 2001, RSL has been a leading provider of e-commerce fulfillment services. We have 10 fulfillment centers across the United States, uh, serving our clients to provide two-day fulfillment with access to five ports. Today we are presenting the webinar, Free Shipping Solutions for E-Commerce Retailers, and have invited a couple of e-commerce experts from RSL to share information that we hope will help your business. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Before the webinar began, we encourage you to tweet your questions with the hashtag RSLFreeShip, and you can continue to do so throughout the presentation. Additionally, you can use the chat button in your WebEx control panel to submit any questions. At the end of the presentation, time permitting, we will have answers, uh, we will have time to answer your questions that you present us. Finally, a link to a recording of the webinar will be sent to all participants later this week. Now let's briefly review what we'll cover today. Our goal is to provide you with actionable tips that you can use in your fulfillment operations to make free shipping a profitable offering for your e-commerce store. First, we'll look at the changing consumer expectations regarding free shipping and review solutions that can help you increase sales and profit margins. Next, we'll look at freight operations and reveal the keys to reducing supply chain costs. Finally, we'll review tips to lowering your fulfillment fees through order accuracy and briefly dive into achieving the five nines or .99999 accuracy rate. Achieving that goal will certainly lower your costs. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Jim Gardner, who will, who will review your, how merchants can compete in the evolving e-commerce industry. Uh, Jim is a seasoned veteran in the e-commerce space and has guided many entrepreneurs to success. Jim, take it away. Thanks, Mike. So as you all know, uh, e-commerce is a very competitive industry and the pressures of providing free shipping are just simply not going away. We can really thank Amazon Prime and the FBA model for this. Uh, and they did this while operating a $7 billion loss in shipping um, last year, which is simply not uh, a luxury that most e-commerce retailers can afford. Uh, the result of this is consumers are, frankly, they're now a little spoiled. They expect free delivery on all orders, uh, and in some cases, they expect that those orders delivered in a very quick time. Uh, free shipping is still the number one driver uh, for conversions. Um, nine out of ten shoppers agree that free shipping is the number one reason why they check out on your site and more than half of cart abandonment is caused by shipping and handling costs that are unexpected to that consumer. What we found by doing our research is that consumers value free over fast. So while lots of people are trying to figure out how to do same day delivery, two day delivery, what we found is the most important driver is low cost or free delivery. Free, free delivery increases sales, increases conversions. In fact, it increases your average cart costs. We see a, an average of 30% more spent per order when free shipping is included. And free shipping is such a driver of conversions that a customer is more likely to shop with you if they can save $6.99 on shipping versus a $10 coupon discount. Now, how do you manage that with rising shipping costs? Since 2009, FedEx and UPS have been aver averaging about a five to six annual increase in shipping cost. Uh, in fact, if you were lucky enough to be in e-commerce back in 2006, it costs twice as much now to ship a five pound box cross country using UPS ground or FedEx home uh, than it did in 2006. Um, now, you would think that uh, uh, this is, has created a, a increased profit margins for the, the shippers, but in fact, profit margins are down they're making more money than ever, however, um, but they've had to invest in infrastructure to meet the rising shipping demand. So they're making less cost per box, but they're making more money overall because volume has uh, exponentially increased. Now, how can you manage some of this on your own? Uh, negotiate volume discounts. Um, so understand your shipping data. You know, one of the first things we do here at RSL from a consultative approach is do a deep dive into your business, figure out how many packages you're shipping per month, what your average weight per package is, where you're shipping to, as far as your destination zip codes or country, 
and the shipping characteristics, special packaging or handling needs. Uh, diversify by negotiating with multiple carriers. Um, here at RSL, we work with everyone, U UPS, DHL, FedEx, USPS. Um, by working with multiple carriers, you're able to identify what each one of these carriers are good at. Uh, you may have one carrier that excels in international delivery, another carrier that excels in low, low weight under one pound delivery, and yet another carrier that excels in one to five or five to 10 pound packages. So work those sweet, pots, what, uh, work those sweet spots, find what works best for your business, and have a diversified carrier relationship. Um, in order to do this, you have to utilize a carrier neutral shipping tool. In our cell, we have what we call our Smart Ship Optimizer, which is a hybrid rate shop tool that takes into account low cost and time in transit. Um, you need a tool that's able to ship through DHL, FedEx, USPS, um, and has some logic base behind it. While you're negotiating these carrier discounts, just be very careful as far as uh, thoroughly going through every term. A lot of carrier agreements contain penalties if you don't reach volume goals. Um, you may have a low base rate, but a high uh, uh, residential area surcharge. There may be excess aerial charges. Um, and you may have to pay a penalty if you don't reach those volume goals. So just be very careful as you're reading through these agreements um, as it can be a little bit difficult to manage. Um, in addition to negotiating volume discounts, uh, one of the best ways and easiest ways to control your costs is ship from multiple locations. So you see this infographic here. Um, a lot of people would view a centrally placed fulfillment center as sort of an optimum solution. Um, you can see going to the northeast, the southeast, and the west coast, uh, there's still quite a bit of transit time, which equates to cost. Uh, by using more of a network approach or a multi-facility approach, you can see how that cuts down your time in transit, uh, which also equates to lower shipping costs. Uh, for some customers shipping under one pound, you may think that this is not a good option for you, uh, but even, even under one pound shipments, by utilizing a multiple facility solution, you can lower your rates as much as 10 to 20% by using some of these economy-based shipping options while not sacrificing time in transit. In fact, we did a case study uh, with a recent client that was shipping on their own account uh, using a single location, shipping UPS and USPS ground. Their average time in transit was two to eight days. After leveraging the RSL network and our smart ship optimizer, uh, and our volume discounts with UPS, DHL, and FedEx, shipping out of three locations, we were able to lower their, their time in transit to one to two days and save them 65.6% .6 in total shipping costs while reducing their time in transit to one, by one to six days, um, which also has additional cost savings as far as customer service expense, cancellations, refunds, uh, where my package calls, those types of things. Um, in addition to rising small parcel costs, we're also seeing rising supply chain costs. Uh, if you see on the right there, 50% of all e-commerce order costs go to transportation. Uh, so shippers should expect to pay more for freight as well. Um, here at RSL, we have the luxury of having our own freight division, our smart freight division, which is run by uh, Bob Cruz, and I've got Bob Cruz here today to help talk to you a little bit more about managing those costs and complications, getting your products from your manufacturers. Well, thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. And thank you, folks. We appreciate your time. I'd first like to discuss with you uh, the pitfalls of self-managing your own freight. Uh, since transportation cost makes up the bulk of the expenses e-commerce retailers face, it's critically important to do everything you can to keep costs down and save when possible. Here are the pitfalls of managing your own freight. Now, throughout the years, freight management has become increasingly complex. Many positions require training and certifications. In addition to the knowledge base required to successfully navigate these functions in order to oversee a supply chain's logistic operation, you must stay on top of numerous domestic and international shipping regulations. If your shipments do not comply, you may face seizure and other delays that will end up costing you more money. A third-party logistics provider, also known as a 3PL, has both the knowledge and connections to keep your freight and shipping costs at the absolute minimum. Attempting to book your own shipments will inevitably result in higher rates. Freight management is very time-consuming. Outsourcing your logistics to professionals will give you more time to focus on important areas of your business. 
A lack of resources will severely hinder your ability to save the most money and move your freight in the most efficient manner. A 3PL has resources to provide multiple options for all modes of transportation, air, ocean, and land. Working with a 3PL will eliminate the need to establish credit with multiple carriers. The bottom line is that if you plan on managing your own freight, you should expect it's going to cost you more money and more time. International transportation cost is a major expense for e-commerce retailers and will continue to increase year over year. Here are my tips for saving time and money. Shipping international freight is far more complex than moving domestic freight. You will need to hire a reputable international freight forwarder customs broker. They must be fully licensed and CTPAT certified. They get heavily discounted pricing from the airlines and the steamship lines. Talk with your friends, your business associates and vendors. Seek a referral. A quality forwarder will save you time and money. They will guide you through the entire process. They will provide the correct codes used to classify your goods. This will determine if your products are duty free or the correct duty rate you will pay. They provide multiple rate quotes using recommendations of transport for both air or ocean shipments. This will include transit times with options, expedited or deferred. They will handle the customs clearance. They also provide carriers to recover your shipments from the airports or the ports. Your forwarder must be a great communicator and completely transparent. This is the make or break for me because you must know where your shipments are at all times. Accurate billing, the final bill must mirror the original quote. The exceptions are accessorial type charges for customs exams, carrier detention, and steamship line demurrage. And once you have a partnership in place, find another one and have them compete for your business. Now, domestic transportation cost increases annually and is a major expense for e-commerce retailers. Here are my tips for saving time and money. You will need to hire a third-party logistics provider, also known as a 3PL. They must have the authority to operate as a freight broker and must possess a surety bond. They get heavily discounted pricing from the carriers. Now talk with your friends, your business associates and vendors and seek a referral. A quality 3PL will provide the correct freight classification used to determine your product's class rating. The class rating is a primary component in determining the freight rate. For example, apparel. Apparel is a density-based item. To determine its class rating, you must determine the pounds per cubic feet of the shipment. Your 3PL will provide rate and service quotes with multiple options based on price and transit times. They will negotiate reduced accessorial charges, such as appointment fees, residential fees, liftgate delivery fees, and inside delivery fees. Your 3PL must be a great communicator and completely transparent. Accurate billing. The final bill must mirror the original quote. However, changes in weight, dimensions, and or the services requested will result in revised charges. Customer service support. They're the experts. They will work with the carriers to overcome service failures, lost or damaged shipments. They support you in filing freight claims. And once you have a partnership in place, find another one and have them compete for your business. We want to share with you today a case study. We have a client whose quarterly freight bill averaged slightly more than $135,000 per quarter. The client was shipping raw materials such as foodstuffs, flowers, oils, packaging. Their finished goods uh, were baking blends, sweeteners, skincare products, protein powders. Now they were utilizing vendors and suppliers throughout the U.S. and Canada. The client was moving full truckloads, partial truckloads, and less than truckload shipments. However, the client allowed their vendors and suppliers to control the transportation. They were convinced they were getting a great deal. I was introduced to this client and immediately identified opportunities to save them a significant amount of money. I currently work with four separate third-party logistics providers. Each have their own strengths. The end result was we were able to achieve an average quarterly freight bill savings of over $28,000. However, the time saved by our client was priceless. Now, taking freight management off their plate freed up valuable time and allowed them to focus on growing their business. I look forward to answering any questions you may have on these tips and other freight management challenges you may be facing at the end of our presentation. 
To wrap things up, it's my pleasure to reintroduce RSL CEO, Michael Manzioni. Mike has over 30 years of expertise spanning operations, management, and supply chain in e-commerce, retail, pharmaceutical, and food and beverage industries. Mike will give you some tips on how to improve your order fulfillment speed and accuracy to reduce cost and increase margins. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Fast and accurate order fulfillment is one of the basic benefits e-commerce retailers expect to receive when they outsource their fulfillment to a 3PL. Yet few realize that many logistics providers fail to meet this level of service. But one thing is for sure, too many inaccurate orders will destroy your e-commerce business. So let's look at a few of the fulfillment errors that will affect your business. Um, first of all, lost revenue. We're not only talking about the current purchase cost, but also about the customer lifetime value. Uh, also the cost of re returning incorrect orders. Uh, we would strongly suggest that if you can, and based on the cost of the product itself, compare, compare the cost of acquiring the customer and the value of the item, and potentially there might be better goodwill there uh, and savings of money not to have the, actually the product returned to you. Uh, third, the cost of reshipping correct orders. Uh, and last is administrative costs. We're talking about customer support, accounting, uh, staff, and other fixed costs. The costs resulting from fulfillment errors can quickly drain profits. At RSL, our goals are achieve the five nines, and we have developed a system of processes that align with our software to assist our clients and team to achieve that goal. Remember, the goal is to reduce the amount of times the product must be touched. Here are some of the techniques that we use, which you can also deploy. Start at manufacturing and consider how the product is produced, from material to package design. If possible, have the item manufactured in a box that is suitable for label-only shipping to reduce the amount of wasted space and fulfillment fees. Remember, think the difference between dim weight versus physical weight. Limit the variety of packaging materials and components of a package shipment to keep costs low. Management of stock simple and packaging process, processes efficient. Once at the warehouse, the most important part to contributing to inventory accuracy is receiving the product properly. It's critical that ASNs match packing slips, and you'd be amazed at how many times we receive product. The packing slip says something, the ASN says something else. Um, make sure the packing slips are included with your cartons and pallets. Products should come in barcoded with a SKU, minimally, and if you're selling in a retail market, uh, it needs to include a UPC, and if you're selling uh, internationally, especially in the European Union, is they have an EAN. Don't mix SKUs in cartons or pallets. All outside cartons and pallets should be properly labeled to identify the product. At put away, arrange items by product line, SKU, or zone. Pairing is another helpful idea for improving pick efficiencies. Many times when product A sells, so will product B. Locate those products next to each other, even in combinations of more than two. Items that are often sold in pairs can be assembled as a kit for a more efficient picking process and increase order accuracy. Kit or assemble these products in advance of picking. That's critical. Lastly, fulfillment automation is drastically changing and should be a key consideration in lowering your costs. As many of you know, there are further disruptions that are in the early stages or affect, affect your shipping decisions in the next few years. We're seeing an increased number of disruptors in e-commerce delivery with new technologies uh, hoping to satisfy the increasing demands of customers. We see that especially in the final mile. For example, we're starting to see drones make rural deliveries. We're starting to see self-autonomous cars tied to an app that are making deliveries. Some carriers are testing making deliveries to the trunk of your car. Uh, we've seen companies like Postmates, Uber, Lyft making deliveries also now. Recent announcements by Walmart to have their staff make deliveries. The key takeaway here is that the new customer market now demands free shipping to compete. While rising shipping costs and new technologies do create obstacles for online businesses, having the right shipping and fulfillment strategy in place can make free shipping profitable for your e-commerce business. To recap, merchants should look to four things. One, leverage carrier relationships to combat rising shipping costs. Two, utilize multiple locations to reduce costs and time in transit. Three, lower freight costs with an established freight professional. Four, improve efficiency and fulfillment to increase margin. So with that, we'll go ahead and take some time for questions. 
Just a reminder, if you have not submitted your questions via Twitter, you can type your questions into the chat box in your WebEx control panel. So let's see if we have any questions. Okay, I think I've got a couple questions here. Um, the first question here, I think, really is for you, Bob. Um, it says, how much does it cost to hire a freight broker? Well, thanks, Mike. Great question. Uh, interestingly, it doesn't cost a thing. Uh, the beauty of working with a freight broker is you don't see any upfront cost. What you really see is upfront savings. They're all about saving you money. Now, they make money doing business with you based on what they're buying and selling their service for, but you don't see any cost up front. It's all about the opportunity to save you money. I hope that answers your question, Mike. It does. Thanks, Bob. Um, I've got another question here. Um, Jim, I think you should take this one. It says, our current product weighs 2.2 pounds. We are making some product enhancements and want to make sure we don't drastically increase the shipping costs for our customers. Is there a certain weight we should strive to keep our products under? Example, three pounds to save increased shipping costs. Jim, what would you say? Yeah, so, so a 2.2 pound package is gonna be billed out at three pounds. So I just wanna be sure you guys understand how that works. Um, first of all, I would, I would uh, say making product enhancement is a, uh, a great idea, and I would applaud you for trying to create a better product, more value for your customer. Um, there's a few things that I would look at, you know, as far as the product enhancement, um, are you adding a, a booklet? Are you adding a, a DVD or a CD-ROM? Um, I got a package the other day with an instructional DVD. I don't even have a DVD player. Um, is this something you can deliver digitally through a link or an ebook? Um, if it's a, a product that you're making enhancement on, a physical product, uh, there will be added expense if you're shipping out of a single location. So going from, say, a three pound to a four pound package, shipping to a zone six, seven, or eight, you could see uh, as much as a dollar in additional shipping cost. Uh, what, we've, what we've found and what we've been able to negotiate with our carriers, however, though, is a lot of times a zone two or three, some of the shorter zones, have the exact same rate from one to five pounds. So um, with a diversified distribution strategy, leveraging multiple facilities, you're given the freedom to make those product enhancement um, without the risk of increasing your shipping cost. Okay, thank you, Jim. Let me see here, I've got a third question. Um, I think I'll take this one. It says, how does price come into play marketing a product? Um, it's a great question and, and it obviously comes into play and, and probably is one of the key considerations in terms of your success. Um, I, I would say you need to consider price elasticity and whether your product is branded or not branded because I think the strategy is, uh, is, is different for those two scenarios. Um, but typically, you, you want to do, you have, you have more chance of price elasticity if you have a special product or a branded product. Um, I would certainly suggest that you do some A-B testing, uh, do that over multiple channels uh, to really understand what, what price works for, 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 for which channel. Um, typically, we see clients, for example, uh, offer the same product, but with a little twist in different channels to see if they can get a, an additional price. Uh, there may, might be an additional free item that uh, entices the customer to pay more money. Um, so consider your prices, do some A-B testing, and, um, and, and understand the best way to, to, to market your product. Um, so we have another question here. Do you want to ask that question, um, um, Carolina? Yes, so one of our participants asks, how well does the 3PL handle claims, and how would you handle a missed pickup by the 3PL? Okay, well first, uh, claims. Now each 3PL has a different process for filing claims. Some, you as the shipper or the owner of the goods, file a claim against the 3PL who then files it against the carrier. But the important component here is that the 3PL will provide assistance in helping you file that claim. And we all know cargo claims are, are are very difficult and very complex, but they will provide support for you uh, securing all the documents such as the original bill of lading, the delivery receipt, the commercial invoice. They do provide assistance for you, although in some cases you may have to file it direct with the carrier, but they're always there for assistance. Now, miss pickups. What you do is, in, in the event that you have a miss pickup, and, and this is something you will experience periodically, 
you go to your third party logistics provider and you let them know that you had a missed pickup. Their role then is to not only reschedule the pickup for the following day, but to try to identify the root cause of that failure. Why was the pickup missed? Was there any type of paperwork or communication error? Uh, that's something that needs to be investigated. Carriers will have a reason why a pickup was missed. It could simply be an electronic transmission failure. But it's important to know that they will support you and they go to bat for you with the carrier. Remember, they have the leverage. They're spending millions of dollars every year with these trucking companies. So they will provide support. Hey, I, I want to address this from a small parcel standpoint. Okay. Um, in, in our environment, by using the hybrid shipping model and shipping through multiple carriers, um, we're able to determine whether your product is a low value product uh, or high value product and make professional recommendations on using a shipping method either that comes with added, uh, comes included with insurance or not included in, with insurance. So a lot of our electronic uh, companies that are shipping out items priced between $100 and $300 are going to ship ground that comes with uh, included insurance and we would certainly manage those claims um, if that package was undeliverable or got lost in transit. A lot of our customers are shipping products that have a manufacturing cost, say, under $10. In that case, we're leveraging low-cost shipping solutions such as uh, UPS SurePost or DHL Smart Mail, and those, those ship methods simply don't come with insurance, so unfortunately you're unable to file a claim. So um, what I like to tell my customers is you really need to evaluate what the cost savings is of using one of these uninsured shipping methods um, versus an insured shipping method what would you expect as sort of an average default rate? For example, if you're saving, say, $3 a package um, and your default rate is 1%, um, you know, for every one package out of 100 that doesn't get to the customer, you're saving $300. So if that's a $30 item, you're still up 10x. So there's, mary there's many variables that go into, um, A, either using a shipping service that has the ability to file a claim um, that comes insured versus using a small parcel shipping service that does not. And, in, and with our company, if you're shipping through a insured um, service, we will file the claims on the small parcel side for you. Okay, uh, Bob, this question's for you. Uh, what's the difference between international and domestic freight forwarders, and do I need both? You do need both, Mike. Uh, it's a great question. International freight forwarders live in the world of international freight forwarding air and ocean shipments. They are up to speed on bonds, customs entries, clearance, that's what they do, that's the world they live in. Let them do their international, as far as a domestic third-party logistics provider, they concentrate mostly on less than truckload and full truckload size shipments. They are the experts moving products within the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So when we think of international, we naturally think of importing and exporting. For the US, Mexico, and Canada, that we consider domestic transportation only because there are some differences. The third party logistics providers uh, on the domestic side, they have their specialties, international freight forwarding partnerships with third party logistics providers on the international side live in a completely separate world. Keep them separate, develop relationships, personal relationships with both service providers. You'll have sales and operations contacts and uh, it's important to know, if, if you really want to be successful, it really depends on your relationship. These folks want your business. They want to help you. Uh, invest your time in getting to know them. They'll spend time getting to know you, so you and, and it's important to notice that, you know, obviously we do business with folks that we know, that we like, and that we trust. And uh, when you get to the point where you can trust these folks, uh, whether it's international or domestic, uh, you've already won. Okay. Good answer. Uh, I'm told that we're having some sound difficulties or, or potential sound difficulties, so you know, I apologize for anyone that's experiencing that. I we'll want to remind you that this webinar will be sent to you also, um, so any difficulties you're having uh, right now, we'll, we'll make, certainly make it up to you when you get that, uh, that connection to the webinar recording. Uh, but there is another question here that I'm going to go to Carolina for. Carolina, you want to ask a question? Yes. Uh, participant would like to ask, is it better to ship skincare products in a cardboard box or a soft side envelope? You want, uh, there's different parts of this. Why don't you take part of this, Jim? Okay. I, I, um, uh, what's funny is Michael and I were just talking about this outside, and um, 
you know, there's, there's two schools of thought here. You know, there's the school of thought of perceived value in creating a premium customer experience. Uh, we're seeing a move with the box of the month type clubs and you see these YouTube videos all over the place, unboxing videos. Um, there is a move towards uh, having a um, having experience as far as, as when a, a customer receives their package, you know, of uh, having a, a little bit of joy opening that package. If, the, if your cost of goods is low, if you're selling this item for a high amount, my recommendation would be as much perceived value into the packaging as possible. Another 50 cents for a box, you know, maybe some nice uh, tissue paper or a nice insert, you know, put the, uh, put the skin care in a nice organza bag or a velvet bag. You know, these incremental increase in costs um, can go a long way as far as, as reducing returns, um, increasing repeat purchases. Um, I would say if you're working with a fulfillment company and they're focused solely on uh, getting you the lowest cost as possible and not presenting you with other options to, uh, for premium packaging, uh, they're probably doing you a disservice. You know, ultimately the answer is, is split test. Uh, you know, take 100 orders, ship them out in a nice box. Take 100 orders, ship them out um, in a poly bag, you know, and see ultimately what, what gives you the best results. Um, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there in the space as far as, you know, customers don't care, they're opening the package, they're throwing it away. Um, I think that was a, that's a dated school of thought, and I think, um, you know, the, today's consumer is also looking, you know, for a little bit of joy in opening the package. So I guess my recommendation would be, um, you know, go with the premium packaging, um, you know, see if that increases your, your uh, revenue, your lifetime value reduces your returns. You know, if you're using poly bubble, bubble now, um, as far as protecting the product, uh, I don't think there's any question. I think Michael backed me up on this. Skincare is a perishable item. It's a messy item. Um, if it arrives, you know, if someone's spending seventy-five, eighty dollars for a, a bottle of skincare and it arrives busted and the lotion is all over the inside, it, it's just a terrible experience. So um, I would view that as what I'd call kind of, you know package insurance, uh, putting it in a box, maybe even a little bit of bubble wrap with some nice craft paper, nesting it in there, you know, giving that customer a premium experience and also reducing the risk of just having a messy delivery um, where the customer is just extremely turned off by the arrival of the product. Yeah, I, th I think Janelle's a great answer and, and I, I would say, you know, we have clients who do it both ways. You know, we have clients that put it in the manila bubble mailer and send a low cost and we have clients that do uh, custom packaging um, that has specific places to put their product in and a special card and so it really depends on what, what your brand is what do you want the experience of your customers to be the last comment I would make that at gyms would be um, consider the price of, of of the packaging and you know uh, and, and what your what your points are that you can in terms of what you can afford to do and, and sometimes you got to be careful that you don't add enough packaging there too that it takes you to the next weight or dimension so you, you maybe take something that's one pound or under one pound I push it over one pound and if and you didn't consider that cost and now you're losing more money on or you've, you've lost some margin on it because you didn't consider that cost but uh, that's 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 probably um, all I could add to what Jim's Jim said there yeah and, and I will say this that a lot of fulfillment companies will make recommendations based on what's maybe easiest and most profitable for them so you may run into a situation where the fulfillment company is saying it doesn't make a difference. Put it in the bubble mailer. Let's ship it out to the customer. It's going to save you money. Really what they're saying is this is easier for me. I can get more packages out the door and I can make more money. Okay. Um, we have a whole a whole lot more questions here. Are we, we're doing okay on time it looks like. Yeah. So Carolina, why don't you ask the next question then? So this one might be a little bit uh, related to what you were just talking about. Um, what is your opinion of shipping via USPS? Um, you know, so a couple points on that. So, it, probably if, if you were considering the um, economies of scale, and if we're talking about the lowest cost, um, many times USPS is the lowest cost, um, but not necessarily always. Um, we use USPS and we allow clients to USPS, so we consider that as part of our offering. Um, I, I, the reason I, I pause a little bit is because we see a, a higher percentage of, of shipments never making it to the end consumer, unfortunately. Um, so it's, it's, you know, you pay for what you get. Um, and, you know, we typically see 
somewhere between two and three percent of all shipments in USPS um, that frankly never make it to the end cons to the end consumer. Um, and so it depends on what your pain point is there, um, and you have to consider cost versus service. Certainly UPS, FedEx. Uh, do a better job. Uh, DHL probably is right below that, and I think USPS is last. I think USPS probably competes more at the same level of the regional carriers in terms of, of accuracy and, and delivery times and, and, and confirmation, but uh, we certainly consider them as a competitive uh, uh, partner, and, and there's some advantages and reasons why you should consider uh, USPS. Um, anything to add to that, Jim? Yeah, I, what I would add is you know, it really depends on where you are in your business model. I think for a, a, a young entrepreneur starting a business, selling products online and shipping them themselves, using stamps.com and shipping through USPS is a great solution. It's, it, I think it's the easiest way for you to get started. Um, it's a simple, easy solution. It tracks. I think as your business grows, your needs will expand. And I think you need to look at alternative shipping solutions. Um, you know, managing multiple relationships with FedEx, with UPS, with DHL takes time and effort. So, you know, at launch, uh, maybe a, a simple USPS solution is a, is, is a great, easy, um, you know, uh, reliable solution. But as your business grows, as you're doing 50, 100, 200, 300 orders a day, I think at that point you really need to look at diversification. And, I, and, and we certainly do have uh, shipping options that are lower than USPS. I think when you're in the kind of three, four, five ounce range, the savings aren't as much, you know, maybe 10, 15 cents an order. But once you get up into the eight, 10, 12, um, 13 ounce range, you know, there, there's some pretty significant savings, 50 to 75 cent over USPS. So, you know, my answer is, you know, starting off doing it yourself, USPS is great, you know, low scale, um, low risk, uh, low maintenance as you grow, you know, you're gonna need more, more arrows in your quiver at that point. Thanks, Jim. I've been handed another question here, and, and, and Bob, I think this one goes to you. Uh, it says, my manufacturer takes, takes care of freight for me already. Why do I need to hire someone else to do it? Well, it's all about the cost. Uh, most important, you know, the cost for, per se, an international shipment, whether it's an air or ocean shipment, the manufacturers have deals with steamship lines and, and air freight forwarders and air carriers. And often they bury the cost of transportation in that invoice. So you don't actually see a breakdown on what the transportation cost was for that specific move. Now what you can do is ask them, hey, do me a favor, show me the cost for my merchandise and then show me the cost of my merchandise without freight. And now you have a basis for comparison. You can now compare apples to apples. So when you reach out to your favorite 3PL, they can provide a quote for you based on that transportation, and you can compare and contrast who gets the better deal. A lot of times, they will pass on a savings to you, but it might not be as significant as the savings that you can get working through your relationship with your third-party logistics provider. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, the next one comes to us from Carolina. Carolina, what do you have? Any suggestions for low-cost shipping options to consumers in Hawaii? Hawaii, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, 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 the, the short answer is no, um, because of, of two reasons. Obviously, one is location, but the second one is just the amount of traffic going to Hawaii doesn't really make it a really competitive market for a lot of carriers to uh, offer other benefits for. So I don't have any clear solutions from a small carrier um, suggestion in terms of small packages. Jim, do you have any comments on this one? Yeah, I. I uh... You know, as, as many things that USPS doesn't do well, I, I think shipping to, to Puerto Rico and, and Alaska and Hawaii, they, they do very well. So I, I think um, the United States Postal Service probably takes, takes a loss on those packages um, just because they have to provide those U.S. citizens a service. So, um, you know, a priority mail or first class solution generally to a U.S. territory is probably going to be a little better than using DHL and FedEx. Okay. Bob, do you have any comments on that or not? Well, the only comment I would have in terms of uh, freight transportation to Hawaii, uh, as we all know, those, you know, freight transportation uh, moves in containers from the port of Long Beach, Los Angeles to Honolulu. Now, in terms of your opportunities to save money, uh, of course, depending on the size of the shipment, some carriers are better equipped to do this than others. You have the common carriers 
who specialize in LTL transportation within the United States, but you also have common carriers and forwarding companies who specialize in transportation to Hawaii. Now, they might have the best pricing available. It all depends, and you should compare and contrast. Get a quote from the YRCs, Old Dominions, ABF freight systems of the world, and then also get a quote from the folks like American Fast Freight, Honolulu Freight, Royal Hawaiian. Those folks might have better pricing options for you. Okay, I've been handed another one here. It says, do you see shipping costs stabilizing or decreasing in the future, uh, especially with new technologies? Um, that, that's a tough one. But Bob, from the freight side, what do you see? Freight side, uh, I've been in the business more than 30 years now. And for every year, and in some cases twice a year, there's an annual rate increase. Sometimes it's once a year, sometimes it's twice a year. Typically increases range between three and a half to six and a half percent. So if there's gonna be one increase in 2017, it'll typically take place on April 1st and it'll be in the range of 6%. If there'll be two increases, you may see one in January and then you may see one in August. So it really all depends on what the big guys do. And when I mean the big guys, I mean the big class one common carriers, YRC, UPS Freight, Old Dominion, ABF Freight System. They all follow suit and do what each other does. So if one carrier is opting to take an increase, they all take one. It's a me too situation. But freight will always increase year after year after year. Now the way to combat that is through your discounts, working with third party logistics providers, or if you have to, working directly with carriers. Yeah, I would add on the small package side, um, we don't see the prices going down either. We, we still see the prices are going to continue to rise. I think what we're going to see is more choices. But uh, if you're looking at the next three to five year window, we don't see anything that's going to lower the price um, uh, to a point where it's going to make a competitive advantage. So we, we would suggest to also consider five to six percent price increases year to year uh, as being the norm. Yeah. And, and I would add that, you know, thinking that Uber or Lyft delivery um, is going to lower, lower your shipping rates, um, you know, what we see those guys doing right now is more of the food delivery for your Blue Aprons, your HelloFresh, your perishable type goods. So I think the alternative shipping methods are opening, um, you know, shipping and, and uh, for companies that traditionally haven't, sh haven't had that luxury. Um, so, so perishable goods, foods. Um, items that have to be delivered same day or next day. So um, I see those technologies more as opening, you know, CPG, uh, uh, food and perishables, um, you know, Amazon groceries, uh, you know, those, those type of alternative solutions are really right now um, opening up uh, package delivery and fulfillment for industries that haven't traditionally had it. Okay, thank you, Jim. Carolina, you got another question? Yes, um, and Bob, you already touched on this slightly, but uh, participant would like to know what freight carriers do you usually use? Well, because I have multiple options, I use carriers on a local, regional, and national basis. So depending on this type of shipment, if it's a local move in the state of Pennsylvania, I have specialized carriers in that lane. So using a third-party logistics provider provides me with multiple options for not only a local regional or national type shipment. So it's the, the beauty there is the larger carriers like the YRCs, ABF Freight System, Old Dominion, UPS Freight, they're all quality carriers, but they might not be best suited for a regional delivery or especially a local delivery. So working through those companies, you will get those options. And of course, based on the, on the type of shipment it is, carriers, different carriers are better suited for those shipments. Okay, thank you. I've got another participant question here. It says, how is the cost of shipping built into sales price? What factors do need, what factors need to be taken into consideration? Um, okay, so this one can be a little bit on the complex side and depends on what perspective you're looking at this one, but uh, here's, what, here's our experience on this. Uh, I, often, I often see when I talk to the e-commerce clients that Many of them don't even know really what their true costs are, and they don't have that built into uh, their cost. So I would suggest making sure that 
uh, you're looking way beyond the cost of goods, uh, adding your fixed costs into it and including your shipping costs in, in, into understanding uh, how do you need to price this product properly and what are the margins. Um, so definitely uh, consider that in your sales price when you do that. Don't just take a multiple of the cost of goods, take a mul multiple of the cost of goods plus your costs. Uh, and I think that's a better way to approach it to understand uh, what you can offer and what you can't offer. Um, especially when, if you're going to go into avenues like maybe do something that's going to be selling thing on bulk where you're going to maybe do something like on a Groupon or you're going to sell something on Amazon in bulk. Uh, those things uh, you have to really, really clearly understand what your costs are there. Um, Caroline, do we have any more questions on your side? No. No? Okay. Um, I don't have any more questions that were handed to me either, so I think we've covered all the questions. I appreciate everyone for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much for your time. Jim and uh, Bob, thank you guys also. Um, we're going to send out a copy of this uh, uh, to you so that you'll be able to replay this. And if we can offer you any further assistance, uh, please reach out to us. We're, we're happy to help, uh, and we appreciate you joining us. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.